there's so much music technology out there. And so as an educator looking at it, I, what do you look for? Like, what's your filter? Like when you're, you know, evaluating technology for the classroom? Oh yeah. Um, well, I'm in a slightly different universe than a lot of people who leverage technology in their classrooms because I'm um, a lot of elementary, not so much high school. I mean, at this point, I'm honestly an early childhood educator. Like I teach exclusively preschool now and I just um, got made the head of a non-existent, so yeah, I'm soon to be existent infant and toddler program at a music wow. school. Wow. So I'm like in knee deep in child development research right now and like looking at the major approaches to infant and toddler music. But so that being said, I have to look at it technology a little bit differently. I really have to think about accessibility and the ease of use, especially like the UI, the user interface and stuff, because I've encountered technology that seemed like it would be amazing to use. But with even elementary schoolers, it like became apparent pretty quickly that if it wasn't designed for like really easy use, it's like it could be the best piece of technology in the world, but we couldn't even get started. <laughs> so that's like the first um, box I have to check is like, is it straightforward, simple? Is it going to be usable by everybody in my classroom, not just the advanced students who have some experience with technology already. So that's a big one. Um, a second one is, and this is a very difficult one to find, is balancing like musical elements that I want to include in my curriculum with composition, because there's a lot of apps and programs and software where you can compose, but I've noticed a lot of the time it students treat it almost like a video game and like they're dragging and dropping and they're not thinking very thoroughly or being very intentional in what they're doing they're just like there's this novelty effect of new technology and then they like composing but when I look at it after the fact I'm like well what did we really learn and it's you know they learned how to use that technology and then they learned how to make some music they thought sounded cool but it's a lot harder to weave it into an elementary curriculum where there are a lot of standards to be met. So I try and think what standards, how could I weave it in seamlessly, justify it to my administrators, you know, and have the kids on board. So I have to balance like a lot of different elements. Mm -hmm. um, but the musical element one is really tricky. Um, like digital audio workstations, I've really tried and racked my brain to think of musical elements like an excuse to use them <laughs> you know but I can do it with form I can do it with timbre but to do it with like pitches and harmony and stuff you have to it's just there's a lot of steps between introducing the technology and getting to the point where you can talk about harmony and a melody composed by them by the student not just pre-recorded loops as a melody, you know, so that's a hard one for sure. Um, but, you know, with Hyperscore, that's like why I have an interest in it, because I've noticed out of all the kind of platforms for students to compose, I feel like Hyperscore kind of lends itself to including musical elements that I'm trying to teach and that I've taught the same way year after year. And now there's a piece of technology that I can include in way more parts of my curriculum than I ordinarily would be able to, you know, yeah. with technology. So that's kind of why it's grabbing my attention, you know, more so because other pieces of technology I've gotten really interested in. And then I actually try and use it in my classroom and I find like one application of it. And then I can use it during that one part of that one unit throughout the year. And then like at the end of the year, when we have some time to, you know, kind of mess around a little more than I can bring it back, but trying to have like pedagogically sound technology as an elementary school teacher, because I'm not doing a music production class, you know, I need it to right. be like, I think that's know. probably part of the, I mean, not for all, but uh, a lot of the technology was really meant for production for, and uh, Hyperscore was certainly designed for composing for for 
with a pedagogical, you know, intention behind it. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that that certainly makes a difference. But um, and just the visual interface, I think, helps mm -hmm. students track different motives better and you know, kind of forces them to develop ideas and then like think about how those ideas are going to kind of overlap and interact with one another, where it's easy. It's I just noticed it's much harder to keep all that organized and try and follow a motive throughout a piece when you're composing in a piano role like MIDI, you mm -hmm. know, with kids, they will lose sight of it, the big picture very quickly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so the visual aspect of Hyperscore for younger kids you know, is definitely a big plus. Yeah. I've Maybe some it. of them came from uh, like when you have like Todd's mother was a music teacher. I think, you know, music teachers will often take a score and use like a color pencil like this, you know, and mm -hmm. mark the different parts. And it's kind of like, that's like built into hyperscore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> color coding absolutely. Yeah. Motives. Interesting. So, Cece, sorry I interrupted you. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I wanted to say that I've had an opportunity now to work K through 12 and um, teaching hyperscore and uh, every grade level easily is able to get something out of it, whether it's steady beat and rhythm with the kindergartners all the way to, um, you know, combining uh, rhythm patterns and making hip hop pieces with rhythmic and uh, melodic, melodic motifs. But um, we have somebody who's working in Boston right now with three and four year olds. And um, she introduced rhythm first and now she's working on melody and now she's doing tone color. And the interesting part about that is she's a technology teacher. Mm -hmm. So she's using it to teach technology but they're getting the musical aspects out of it. But you know, I 100% agree with you that uh, hyperscore that's the thing I loved about it when I saw it in 2007 is I said um this is the the missing link to teaching all those elements rhythm form tone color temp tempo dynamics you know form harmony it's just perfect for that yeah and I know with a lot of my younger students will do a lot of vocal exploration and I will use these big cards I have with um different contours on them and they mm -hmm. can kind of map those into hyperscore, you know, mm -hmm. so we can just hear like, yeah, when we use our voice, it's just this continuous up and down, but we can have a similar contour and they can see that in the way the notes are arranged, but it's just like a different way of conceptualizing the rise and fall of that contour, you know, in like for, you know, because it's in an instrument and it's forced into the 12 pitches. So it's just like an interesting way to map their understanding of melodic contour what they do with their voices and like how that same thing can be done on different instruments so oh, cool so you're That's actually happening. using hyperscore with these kids now i'm like really trying to figure okay. out the best way to use it oh, like okay. i'm still i'm testing it out in little bits i haven't done like it full blown because unfortunately the where i'm teaching preschool now there is no well, i'm teaching at two different places the main one i've been doing all year has no smart board which makes mm -hmm. it like a big struggle. But I just yeah. recently got a second um, teaching gig where I'm going to be working in a school that has smart boards in every room. So that's why I'm like, and I just started that like two weeks ago. So I'm like really trying to think of how to use technology more with these kids. Um, just, I mean, I know it sounds lame to have that be the limiting factor of the smart board, but when you just have a little laptop screen or a tablet, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just a non-starter, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's good to know. Anyway, we're excited that you're experimenting with that and hope mm -hmm. to keep, you know, sharing with us what you're, you know, any insights that you're gleaning along. With. Yeah. After February break, um, which is not next week, but the following week, um, I will have all new classes at this new um, school after that because they do trimesters. I took over for somebody who was leaving like mm -hmm. at the last minute mm -hmm. and I kind of had to teach what they were had been working on the whole mm -hmm. trimester, but I get kids who have never had music before, you know, from day one in two weeks. So that's why I'm really like in the idea phase of like, I want to have a technology component to it. So that's why I'm kind of, I've been brainstorming 
how I can use hyperscore and it's with preschool. And I think it's, I feel pretty confident that there's going to be some cool applications of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, you're talking about the user interface and, um, you know, sort of usability obviously depends on the age and so on, but uh, with hyperscore, do you feel like there's a kind of a sweet spot, you know, where it matches, you know, capabilities for a certain age or, um, yeah, I'm just curious to know, you know, what you think. Uh, well, I think, I mean, it's well executed and that it seems very scalable. Like I've noticed kids can get started with it pretty quickly and there's not a lot of fuss and there's not a lot of explaining that needs to be done. But like, if you want to take it even farther, there's like no real ceiling on what you can do. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like the, um, the interface is a big strong suit. Um, and I am just a huge fan of the, um, boom whacker color coding because I do boom whackers with a lot of kids too yeah. and it's just so interesting I did a cool I do these weird private general music lessons the music school I worked at wanted another option for parents whose students weren't quite mature enough or hadn't decided on what instrument they want to take yet you know so it's private music lessons but I'm kind of there to explore it's called music exploration and explore different instruments, explores different uses of music. And I have this one girl who's like a precocious composer. Like she's very talented musically, but in an imaginative way. So she's always coming up with melodies that are like pretty good, you know? Wow. Like, I know they're like pretty convincing and they're memorable and they have like a, a very nice contour and sometimes little sequences. She's like seven, like, Oh my God, you know, it's a better melody than I could write. So, but I definitely got her involved with Hyperscore. And what was cool is that she's very active, very high energy. And that's why she's not developmentally ready for um, like an hour long piano lesson. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm working with her. So what I did was after we kind of messed around with Hyperscore, she couldn't sit in front of the computer for very long. So we, I had her compose a melody using um, boom whackers and I laid them all out. And she was like, you know, walking around, hitting a boom whacker and then like stopping and thinking and then singing to herself and picking up different ones. And then we mapped the melody that she came up with into hyperscore just using the color matching. Mm -hmm. So she got to compose using boom whackers and then put it into hyperscore and, you know, she got to then think about what kind of rhythm she wanted. And we kind of messed around with getting the rhythm the way she wanted it. And then we were able to segue into, you know, the contour and harmony and all that kind of stuff. So it was just a really nice segue with the physical instruments that she's used to using in school and we had been working with. And it just mapped one to one, you know, just it's a tiny UI tweak to have the boom whacker color coding, oh. but it like gave me a whole idea for a lesson. So, you know, I that, said it one was... day to Peter and the next day he had it ready to go. And I, I was like this, that I could have never thought that you would be able to do this. He just turned around and did it overnight for me. But I want to point out that I um, substitute taught with a class of students with disabilities at high school. And mm -hmm. they did exactly what you were talking about. They picked color and um, then we placed milk value and um, wrote their themes using the rainbow colored lines. So they're, they're useful not only for young children, but for also with students for disabilities. It allows you to say, do you want the red or the green? Do you want the red or the uh, purple mm -hmm. or that kind of thing? So. Yeah, I know. And that does open up the accessibility a little bit, which is really nice because I just noticed that with other applications, it's kind of like, there's not that much customization or that much user friendliness, you know, built in. So it's like, if there are certain kids who feel frustrated and don't get it, it's like, it can be a real struggle, you know, to like make them feel successful and carry them along, you know, cause they'll get discouraged really early where as the UI with hyperscore, I feel like gives you enough to do right off the bat. And it's like interesting and colorful and, you know, so I appreciate how it's, 
designed for, you know, just for kids to engage in it easily. Do you know about the um, snap to grid feature in, in Hyperscore where, for example, um, I'm going to be doing a long-term sub and I will make it so that the kindergartners only have quarter notes. The first graders will have quarter notes and eighth notes capability so you could do where you could set note values that they're able to use because um, I before I knew about that feature uh, kids were having a hard time little kids were having a hard time stretching the note mm -hmm. value but, but that's something to think about when you're uh, experiment experimenting with your younger students is you know making it so that they're only using certain values yeah, especially if you can map um, like rhythm patterns that they know, or if they know an ostinato, you know, rhythmic ostinato, mm -hmm. you could either just add that in to hyperscore, or you could um, do it as a melodic ostinato, mm -hmm. you know, so that's another mm -hmm. kind of cool use for it, especially with snap to grid, but mm -hmm. yeah, because I find that, you know, even teaching concepts it is hard to consistently come up with interesting ways to get kids composing. And, you know, I feel like kids who really understand material are then able to create with it. It's like kind of a, you know, it's kind of like a final culminating step. But I know a lot of people do composing, you know, well, I don't want, you know, composing where... <laughs> You know, they're kind of like using little circles and I've done it. I'm not trashing it. I've done that where they're using circles and there's like lines on a piece of paper, but kids don't get like immediate feedback. And some of the kids who are really good at audiating can actually hear it. But I notice a lot of the time kids just like the way the circles go and then they don't really know what it sounds like. So, you know, I was trying to, I've been trying to find ways to compose where I know they're evaluating and with hyperscore, they can evaluate it because they can have it played right back to them, you know, and they can kind of iterate on it. And I feel like it's a more genuine form of creativity, you know, where they're really working with the notes instead of just a proxy for the notes. Mm -hmm. okay. you know? yeah. That's a good, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, you went, on, at our second Saturday workshop, you showed us like this idea of using a video game prompt talking about how to get people composing and I I really like the you know we all really love the idea of um giving kids a purpose you know like why am where why am I composing what's this piece of music going to be for right so mm -hmm. I thought that was great and and uh the video games had like a kind of a mood so you could kind of say okay let's play around with that you know let's describe that um what other types of like prompts or composing kind of, you know, structures or, you know, tricks <laughs> do you use mm -hmm. in the classroom? Well, one I've been wanting to do, and this is like a long-term goal of mine. Um, now I, I am only like, I am teaching at those two preschools, but the total hours, it's like fewer than 10 hours a week. I have like multiple small jobs right now. Cause I'm still, I'm getting my PhD at the same time, you know, so I have like a long-term goal where I really want to, and I can tell you about a lesson I did with it and how I would redo the lesson with the hyperscore involved. But what a lesson I did at a previous school, and this was with kindergarten, it was we did a lot of program music. So we um, listened to program music and we watched um, Fantasia, like Mickey Mouse with the brooms mm -hmm. and um, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And we like talked about the different motives and we talked about how the animators reacted to the music and how like the cartoon was reacting and influenced by what was happening in the music and a cool exercise we did was I would play the Sorcerer's Apprentice and I would play it in a couple scenes that we had studied in depth like when the broom comes to life and there's all these musical cues and I would have one student at the front of the room be Mickey Mouse and one student laying on the ground be the broom. And they would have to bring each other, Mickey Mouse would have to bring the broom to life to the music though. 
mm-hmm. like make sure that the musical cues were lined up with when they were casting spells and when the broom would get up and how fast the broom would walk. And we had it, you know, where we had one Mickey Mouse then bring the whole class. The whole class was brooms. And then we marched down the hall with one of the kids with oh. two buckets, like Mickey Mouse with an <laughs> army of kids walking like brooms behind oh. them. Um, so we set the stage with that of like how music can tell a story, you know, in a very, you know, serious way, not just like imagining like if real program music. And then what we did is we read a poem. Um, it was called The Jungle Song. Um, it was this cool poem and it was very like evocative of and like there were a lot of onomatopoeia in it and like it was very descriptive of sounds and sights and smells in the jungle and at the time I had little instrument stations around the room and I had kids work in groups and they would pick a line from the poem and then they would pick an instrument and talk with their group about how what instrument they think would best represent that line in the jungle poem and then how they would play it to and I would do a reading of the poem and then each group would come up and play all the instruments that they had selected for each line and I think I would love to redo that lesson but have the kids create different motives and hyper score or you know and I would be able to time it out because I'm reading the poem but we could have different motives and then layer them in. And each motive, it's just, it would open it up so much instead of just being able to pick up one instrument at a time and play it. And, you know, we were kind of limited. It's like, oh, we're talking about the brightness of something. So we're going to end up, you know, a lot of kids chose a symbol because it had a bright sound, but it was pretty limited and there were some kids who wanted to take it a lot farther and they had a lot of ideas that we like couldn't implement because of the tools at our disposal Mm -hmm. and I want to redo it with hyperscore where we can do a reading of the poem and the whole time they're composing they're thinking of different motives for different lines of the poem so it's another prompt it's not tech heavy like the video game one but they're still using hyperscore it's just now it's with a narrator kind of so again, they have an external prompt. They have something that they have to convey to the audience. You know, so that's one that I'm, I mean, I have like a whole unit plan for the instrument version that I wrote a few years ago and I'm going to revisit it as like a hyper score. Oh, I would project. love to hear how that goes. Um, yeah, we had our last second Saturday, we kind of played around with more programmatic music kind of we had uh I mean for us it was still a group of you know teachers and us <laughs> mm-hmm. kind of modeling yeah. how you can do this and hopefully other teachers will kind of <laughs> watching yeah. and like get some ideas but uh we started with brainstorming about a character just like let's mm-hmm. think of a character and someone I don't know who mentioned capybara but like it's a cool it was animal Lisa. Lisa. it was Lisa oh, I saw that on the blog yeah yeah <laughs> yeah (laughs) and uh it was just it was just really I mean it was in some ways so basic but it was really fun I can imagine kids getting into like you know like a group of them like okay what's a funny character or you know what's a favorite animal and then you know put it in a ridiculous outfit and yeah um make a story like something that happens and make it an adventure you know like you know and what does, you know, what's the shape of the story? And what's the, you know, like, is there a moment where things get tense, you know? And yeah. There, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so that that could be really fun. I would love to try something you know, like that with a group of kids. And the other thought is, you know, because we always thought like this could be like, we don't, I guess there's a part of me that does that, you know, I love music and to like have it bust out of the music classroom to go cross a whole (laughs) school Mm -hmm. you know so if they're like reading a story reading a book in a language arts class or something Mm -hmm. you know like okay let's take the story you're reading now and let's you know create like a motive for this character and that character and you know and and then have them bring it back to the reading class and kind of wow mm-hmm. the teacher <laughs> look what we did <laughs> the story I know and know? I mean this is a, at a basic level but you could do it um you know like, I mean it's like Peter and the Wolf style where each character mm-hmm. has their own motive and then as the teacher reads it I mean this is very basic but you could just 
click play on each of the windows whenever that character makes an appearance, you know, or you could have different windows for different like marked points in the story. And when that, when it's the kid's turn to present whoever's reading the story, like when that character enters the door, they get to play their little, you know, like yeah. that character coming into the room motive that they wrote, you know? Yeah. So it's a little more fragmented, but it's, I feel like remove some of the complexity if you're working with younger kids of trying to mm -hmm. line up what you're reading with a full, you know, like score. Like, <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> it's just a, an, again, pretty basic, but another way to yeah. use it. Yeah. There's so many possibilities. <laughs> so Wonderful. that's great. Well, well, we've, uh, we'd love to keep hearing about, you know, what you're learning, discovering as you explore hyperscore in your classroom. And um, so, anyway, yeah, you'll I, have some preschool material in the coming months. So that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. So are we. So we'll see yeah. you there. All right. Well, <laughs> good so luck, Matt. Bye, David. Bye. Bye.